Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead um, and get started. Welcome to the session, Understanding Enhancing Diversity in Agritourism. Um, first of all, uh, there's some announcements. Um, this will be recorded um, and you can, um, you can watch um, everything, actually all the sessions online um, until a specified date. And um, that date is December 1st. It'll be on the conference website that goes through, I believe it's called Whova. Um, this session, I'm sorry, I'll introduce myself in a minute, but this session is really meant to be uh, a working group session to kind of look at some of the, the issues and obstacles that we see in diversity uh, and bringing diversity both into agritourism providers, but also consumers of agritourism. So that's, that's what we're gonna focus on today. We're actually gonna break out into hopefully working groups that can continue to work on these, these issues um, from a research and outreach standpoint, even after the conference. So we're gonna be doing a little bit of work today. Um, and for our, our, our online people, with, there'll, there'll be a, a working group as well. So if you're online, you, you'll get to participate um, as we go along. So um, this is just our outline for today. Um, oh, sorry, I'm moving two things at once here. Um, I'm just gonna talk briefly about what the goal of the session is. Um, and then we have a panel uh, of people from across the United States who work in um, agritourism and also diversity issues in a broad-based section. Um, I'm gonna introduce them and then I'm going to basically have them talk about a specific issue uh, for five minutes. Um, and we, we're not covering all the issues by any means, we're covering four issues. Um, and then as we talk and go through those, um, we maybe we come up with other issues um, and then we'll basically be um, break, doing breakout groups that will we'll take one of those issues and, and work on a communication plan and that type of thing. Um, so really, yeah, so the goal of this session um, is to encourage innovative research and outreach into socially disadvantaged group involvement in agritourism through networking um, and the creation of working groups. Um, we're really hoping these alliances will encourage critical um, research and outreach, um, as well as support increased access through academics and industry um, to enhance diversity and equity and inclusion in agritourism. We have four panel members. Um, we have Dr. Jason Ensminger, Dr. Susan Slocum, uh, Dr. Claudia Kiel Arroyo, and myself, I'm Dr. Kenna Curtis. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce our panel members and then I'll invite them to come up and, and give a brief uh, talk. Our first panel member is uh, Jason Ensminger. He is currently the Associate Director of the Northeast Regional Center for Rural Development, one of the four of such centers established by the USDA in the United States. Um, he has led their extension related activities, um, including um, support of National Extension Network, National Extension Tourism Network. I know many of you um, are involved with that. Um, his own expertise is in food system entrepreneurship, including current projects that seek to understand how minority owned farms use networks for business success. He has also been an active member of the LGBT plus community, including national and regional queer agricultural industry networks. Uh, in mid-September, Jason will join the faculty of the University of Maine as an assistant professor, where he will lead its extension programming on small business entrepreneurship and innovation in both the Maine Business School and the Maine uh, Cooperative Extension Service. Welcome, Jason. Uh, our next panel member, uh, Dr. Susan Slocum. Uh, Sue is an associate professor uh, in tourism and event management program at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. She's worked on regional planning and development for 15 years. Got to move the slides there, sorry. <laughs> uh, in rural communities in Tanzania, the UK, Belarus, United States. Her primary focus is on rural sustainable development, policy implementation, and food tourism, craft beverage tourism, especially working with small businesses and communities in less advantaged areas. Sue received her doctoral education from Clemson University and is a Fulbright scholar in 2020. She has published uh, 10 books and numerous academic articles, including the two noted here, you've seen in the pictures above, um, she has contributed book forthcoming, uh, building inclusion, tourism, overcoming institutional discrimination and bias. Um, so yeah, so um, there's some pictures of Sue's books. Our next panel member is Dr. Claudia Gil Arroyo. Uh, she is from Lima, Peru, and she's an agriculture and natural resources agent at Rutgers Corporate Extension in Cape May County, New Jersey. She earned a bachelor's degree in tourism management at the University of San Ignacio de Loyola in Peru 
and is an MS in Parks Rec and Tourism in the University of Missouri and recently received her PhD at North Carolina State University. She has experience in tourism industry and academia in Peru and the US and her research focuses on sustainable community development through agritourism, community-based tourism, craft and beverage tourism. Um, and Claudia has done a lot of work um, lurking with uh, Quechua communities um, and women's um, issues in tourism. <coughs> Uh, and finally, uh, myself, um, I'm a professor uh, and extension specialist in the Department of Applied Economics at Utah State University. I received my PhD in econ from Washington State University in 2003. My research interests include ag food marketing, producer adoption, as well as consumer demand for value added specialty and differentiated foods. Um, as an extension specialist, I primarily help growers uh, develop new markets for their products, as well as assess the feasibility of new products and value processes. Um, more recently, uh, I've been focusing on rural community development through food and agritourism, um, and I look to focus more on gender equity and rural entrepreneurship moving forward. Um, I serve on the DEI committee, so diversity, equity, inclusion for the National Extension Tourism Network, um, and I have published uh, chapters in several tourism related books and co authored uh, a food tourism textbook. So um, that's me. So um, I was kind of hoping to do some very quick uh, participant intros. Um, I think we could probably do that um, fairly quickly. Um, if we just want to pass the mic around, maybe just uh, your name affiliation and what your interest is in this um, DIA workshop for today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Camille Colazo. I am from Puerto Rico. I am the executive director of a nonprofit in Puerto Rico, mainly uh, working woman. And my interest here is because uh, we're going to host a workshop for farmers in Puerto Rico, and we have a, an expert on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to learn more. Perfect, thank you. Hi, I'm Myrna Greenfield with Good Egg Marketing and try to incorporate DEI in all the work I do with farmers. Hello, I'm Ann Savage. I'm a tourism extension associate at NC State University. Um, I have a very specific thing I'm interested in today in the workshop. I've had some agritourism farms reach out about land that enslaved people were recently located on. And so looking for ideas of how to work with them to help honor that. Hi, I'm Nikki Nelson from Keene, Ontario, Canada. Um, owner of Nelson Farm that's offering um, agritourism experiences. And we just wanna make sure that everyone feels safe and comfortable included in any of our stays and experiences on the farm. Hello, my, my name is Kumar and I'm from Japan. I study agritourism. Hi everyone, my name is Vera simon Nobes, and I'm with the Farm-Based Education Network and Shelburne Farms. And I'm interested in making sure that our spaces are a place where all feel a sense of belonging. Hi, um, I'm Ani Steele. I am a recent graduate of Chatham's Food Studies Program. And I just started my own like consulting business. And so that's something that I'm interested in learning how to incorporate that. Hi, I'm Shania Flowers, a small urban farm in Springfield, Massachusetts, and also the author of The Brogue Vegan. Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Van Weingarten, Iowa State University Extension, and I help uh, people who are interested in entrepreneurship with agritourism to develop new programs, new businesses, expand their industries, expand their operations. I'm looking for creative ideas on other resources that people can utilize. Hi, I'm Fiona Scott from Scotland. Um, we have an agritourism business offering farm stays. Um, I'm Annie Baggett, the Agritourism Marketing Specialist with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And there are over 46,000 farms in our state. Not all are offering agritourism, but it is a growing industry. So I'm here to learn as much as I can to take back to our state. Uh, hello, I'm Wayne Masika. I am with University of Vermont's Office of Engagement, and we are thinking about how we more proactively connect with historically underrepresented groups in Vermont to offer, to make UVM more inviting. And I heard Western Mass, Springfield. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xinyi Chen. I'm the director of the University of Minnesota Tourism Center. And as we are looking to build up and expand our um, agritourism work, I am here to learn from the panelists and each other. And thank you for the opportunity. Hello, my name is Hanilin Hidalgo. I'm uh, from the Philippines. I think we are, uh, we are the farthest uh, participant from in this uh, workshop. I teach in a university. I teach agribusiness and agritourism. And I also have a small farm wherein we offer uh, farm wellness and the farm school. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah DeFilippi. I'm with the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing, and um, I am heading up our DEI initiatives for the department. So that's why I'm here today. I'm Mari Omland with Green Mountain Girls Farm, and we want to celebrate diversity at our farm. I am Suzanne Henricks. I work for the University of Minnesota Extension as a regional director, and I'm a part of a group that's interested in agritourism. Hi, I'm Margaret DeWitt, a retired dairy farmer, and I'm interested in, in setting up a program where socially disadvantaged youth can benefit from agritourism. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy Sutton. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension with the Southeast Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. And I have a background in diversity, equity, and inclusion and gender. And so I'm interested in figuring out how to kind of bring these values into my sustainability work. Michelle Ledoux, and I'm from Cornell Corporate Extension in Lewis County. Um, in New York, and uh, I'm just interested in general information on DEI. David Ewart, uh, Director of Education for the 48 Education Center in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and uh, just very interested in DEI and the new word A that's being added to it for accessibility. Right. <laughs> Thank you. From Pennsylvania. And I'm here to learn about this new term, agro-tourism, yes. <laughs> and uh, think about having a summer camp for this uh, new concept. Melody, I'm Mohammed, and I'm today here for this diversity, um, I wanna say workshop, I wanna, you know, I know one is very, very important for us to realize that just taking a look at everybody in here, that it needs some more diversity to my, in my opinion. So I know that we have to all work together because we all share the same earth. So thank you. Susan Joy, Montana Department of Commerce, the Office of Tourism, and I'm here to learn. T. Hansen, Executive Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension in Tioga County, which is the Southern Tier Finger Lakes upstate New York. We are just launching a beginning farmer incubator program. And I wanna get, up, get the word out to a really diverse set of, of beginning farmers that want to come onto the land with particularly you know, culturally appropriate crops that they wanna learn how to grow. Jake Kucher from Westfield, Vermont, about two hours from here, maybe one of the closer ones. Uh, we own a dairy and maple farm and we run a bed and breakfast there. Uh, we've been in agritourism since about 1970 and I'm here to learn. Trevor Lane, Washington State University Extension, uh, state specialist and associate professor in community and economic development. And uh, I'm teaching the uh, equity portion on Thursday. So I wanted to see uh, what the diversity side was looking like. Go Cougs. <laughs> I'm Lisa Frank. I am a development strategist with Farm State USA. I'm Penny Leff. I'm formerly agritourism coordinator with the University of California Cooperative Extension. Now I'm working with Farm State USA. Hi, I'm Gail McWilliam Jelly. I work with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension I'm here to pick up pointers to share with the farmers that I work with. Hi, I'm Donna Lindblom, also from University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. And I think today, one thing I'm interested in 
in, in light of this topic is shifting demographics in our state and what that means for us. Hi, everybody. Tim McAfee. I teach college business courses on Long Island, Eastern Long Island. A lot of our students work in the industry and here to absorb as much as I can so I can work with them. Janice Benson with the Michigan Agritourism Association. We re represent hundreds of farms across the state. So I'm just here to learn as much as I can to share that with our member farms. Hello, I'm Joy Bushin. I own Turning Page Farm Brewery and Goat Dairy in Maine. Hi, I'm Rachel Schatz. I'm a current student with Chatham University's Food Studies Master's Program, and mostly just here to learn, also just specifically interested in DEI in the context of agriculture, food systems, um, all that good stuff. Hi, I'm Kristen Devlin. I work at the Northeast Regional Center for Rural Development with Jason, and I'm also just here to learn. Hi, I'm Jeanette Sutherland. I'm from the Caribbean. I have worked in international development for over 20 years, and I left my organization at the end of 2019 and uh, set up registered at Agrilux Marketing in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, we focus on three interdependent uh, sectors, agritourism, health and wellness, and food waste management. And uh, plug for tomorrow's presentation, uh, we're interested in the nexus between agritourism and food system transformation. And of course, how do we market this in very creative ways? Hi, I'm Rachel Callahan. I am the current statewide agritourism coordinator at Penny um, with University of California. And I would like to ensure equity in our programming. And I'm just here to learn from um, around the country of what, what you all are seeing and what you guys are doing in terms of who uh, can benefit from agritourism. Hi, I'm uh, Valeria Klitsunova from Belarus. This is one of East European country. I'm associate professor of Belarusian State University, but also I'm a founder and chair of Association of Agro and Ecotourism of Belarus. They consider me like a mother of agrotourism. We started 20 years ago with the level zero, and now we have more than 3,000 farms that we, uh, who provide this kind of services. I'm interested, uh, I'm very happy that we are so diverse and represent more than 50 countries. I want to learn experience and share my, and I think that uh, I think that it would be good to set up a like international network and uh, do it on a constant base. Also, we were involved in some project connected with gender and uh, people, uh, disabled people. So I like this topic that I'm here. And we also have some, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, okay, ahead. thank you. Uh, my name is Gabriela Abaciu. I'm coming from Romania. I'm a PhD student in um, uh, forest ecosystem services, and I'm interested to see good practices and models uh, for uh, developing uh, agri-tourist services. Thank you. And I guess I have the microphone, so I'll just say my name is Carrie McDougall, and I'm a tour operator, but I'm also producing a PBS series on food and travel and agritourism. Um, we have a few people online. Um, if you're wa uh, watching us virtually and you'd like to introduce yourself, um, go ahead and um, speak up, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Aditya Vardhan Pathak. I'm from Maharashtra, India. And I'm an operator of uh, agri-tourism center known as Parijat Boutique Farm Stays and Agri-tourism Center located at Shahpur near Mumbai. And this topic of uh, DEI initiatives is of interest to me because it is a challenge that I'm facing while operating my agritourism center. And I'll be giving a presentation on that tomorrow at uh, 10.40 a.m. So I hope to get some pointers from this uh, August meeting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claudia uh, Schmidt. I'm with the uh, Penn State, and I do a lot of research on um, women in agriculture and women in agritourism.
Hi, I'm Mariel Borgman from Michigan State University Extension, and I'm a community food systems educator, and I have uh, part of my work in agritourism, and I'm uh, trying to incorporate DEI into all of my work, and I'm here to get some new ideas and perspectives in regard to DEI and agritourism. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Ojim uh, from Kenya, and uh, I'm a farmer and also uh, I'm a chef, but I'm passionate about agritourism, and uh, I want to learn more in this conference so that uh, I also develop my farm uh, to be an agritourism model, where uh, one, I, I can also share with my community uh, and also embrace agritourism because it is very interesting. Uh, I've been following even the works of uh, Dr. Claudia Gilaroyo and even the contribution of uh, Professor. Uh, uh, they've been doing a, a good job on agritourism and they have been following them even in their writings and I appreciate uh, what they've been doing and uh, I want to develop more on agritourism in this area. And I believe this conference uh, will really uh, be of benefit to me and even uh, my community because what I learned from here uh, will replicate it also uh, in our other farms in our community. Thank you very much. Yeah, Professor. Thank you. Any more online? Okay, uh, hearing none, I think we'll have our panels. Again, we're gonna come up, we're gonna talk about four issues, not all of the issues possible. Uh, I actually would like to identify, have audience identify issues when we, we break out into work groups. Uh, and our uh, first speaker uh, will be uh, Claudia Gilarroyo. Um, and I still have your name spelled wrong there, Claudia. I'm sorry, I missed that one. Uh, participation of women and minorities as agritourism providers. So come on up, Claudia. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as Ken mentioned, I'm Claudia Gilaroyo. Um, I'm currently an uh, agriculture and natural resources um, extension agent at Rutgers. Um, and I want to talk to you, I want to be very brief because I'd rather we all talk about it. I want to hear what you think uh, are the major issues here, but basically, um, discuss the participation of women and minorities in general um, as agritourism providers. As you may or may not know, there are several barriers. Unfortunately, farming in general, if we talk about agriculture, um, tends to be a male dominated um, field. Um, and more recently have, has been more effort to understand why is that, right? Why, why is, are only men um, kind of thriving or having the opportunity to thrive um, within agriculture and specifically in agritourism? Um, and so part of the work that I've done um, with specifically in Peru where I'm from, uh, because there are a lot of rural communities that have very traditional um, social structures. Um, and those were the ones that represented the major challenges to them, right? Um, really constraining women's, even if they were interested, even if whether they were better at it uh, in, in terms of management and all that, they were really um, not able to participate um, to the extent that they wanted to. Uh, and those that were able to break into um, those men um, led areas um, have actually um, been thriving, like have been garnering so many benefits that they were they were not anticipating to get, right? They were just doing it, I don't know, to get a lively, livelihood, um, make uh, a living, right? Being able to sustain their families. And then they counter this um, array of benefits that would come along those things, right? Having more independence, uh, increasing um, their pride for their own culture, uh, providing a better life for, for, their, for their children, um, having a greater or uh, I guess mo being more heard in political structures, right? Um, and so uh, 
I, that is the specific case, of course, of, of Quechua communities in Peru, but I, I think we can all agree that that is something that translates uh, beyond Peru in other um, developing countries, even in developed countries uh, where women are still quite constrained in many aspects, right? And agritourism is just uh, one more of them. And th this can also translate um, to other minorities, right? Uh, if we talk about Black people, Hispanic, which is, um, of course, something I'm more uh, familiar with, uh, we can see that there are many, many um, constraints and barriers that we may not be aware of that limit their participation. And this is something that I would really like to hear from you, right? What are those barriers and constraints that you are um, identifying right um, in your in your different spaces and, and countries and and context yeah thank you thank you claudia next i'd like to invite uh jameson uh up to talk briefly about internal experiences and the uh lgbt community thank you kinda um <clears throat> you know i i was struck as as everyone was introducing themselves um, about um, the different experiences and, and interests in this room. And, um, you know, as we've, we've highlighted, we're, we're giving some snapshots. And, and one of the snapshots that I wanted to give that I think we all as a panel had talked about in preparation is um, also thinking about socially disadvantaged groups. Um, for those of us in the United States, that, that term socially disadvantaged has some very specific regulatory and legal meaning, um, but, it also has broader meaning. Um, and so thinking about groups that, in, that encounter social disadvantage that we maybe don't always think about, right? But beyond gender um, and uh, racial and ethnic minorities. And so I wanted to just briefly give uh, some comments on, on a, a group that I work with and, and one that I am myself a part of. Um, so with that, I just wanted to give a, a brief self-identification and disclosure. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I am cisgender, I identify as cisgender, but I also identify as a gay man. Um, and so my comments today sort of come from that perspective and, and that background. Um, in my conversations today, also, I just wanted to note that um, I'll use acronym LGBTQ+, which means lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, but I'll also use the word queer. Uh, to describe a community or population collectively. And I just wanna note that the word queer uh, can uh, be a contested term for many, but is increasingly reclaimed by many in the population, specifically in the literature on queer farmers. Um, we see this term a lot. Um, the, the interesting thing is that for this community, we have very severely limited data and research on LGBTQ plus and queer farmer populations. We know that these populations exist and, and actually sort of at the end in the United States, at least at the end of the Obama administration had a bit of a renaissance within the LGBTQ plus community as it at its nexus with farming and agriculture and agricultural industry. Um, as some new networks uh, that were developed through social media, but also through uh, efforts of the US Department of Agriculture. Um, but despite that sort of renaissance and bringing together of the community, we still know very little about the challenges that the LGBTQ community in agriculture faces, what their operations look like, the strategies that they utilize, and how their networks develop. Um, and this is particularly important to our conversations about agritourism because of agritourism's unique role as we've seen throughout this conference as a livelihood strategy for entrepreneurs to diversify. Um, what's interesting about that is that some preliminary evidence on queer farmers um, does show um, that you know, they, they often exist in pockets um, or within specific communities, although they are quite widespread, um, that farming can play a very important role for queer farmers in their individual lives, um, their health and their personal journeys, um, that many LGBTQ plus operations appear to be smaller in scale, um, but that they also incorporate sustainable practices more and engage in collective strategies more, whether that's through cooperatives or multifamily management. 
um, and that agritourism activities present on LGBT led operations um, can play a vital role with both the economic and financial aspect, as I mentioned, but also in sort of the non pecuniary well being of the entrepreneurs right in their ability to feel self fulfilled or to build community uh, in rural spaces where that community may not always exist. Um, there's a growing segment of LGBTQ travelers also, and uh, my colleague, Dr. Slocum, I think we'll talk a little bit more about sort of the consumer side, um, just writ large, but there's a growing uh, segment of LGBTQ plus travelers that are seeking affirming and welcoming agritourism experiences, particularly those that are provided by their fellow LGBTQ plus members who are agripreneurs. Um, so this preliminary evidence really implies that queer farmers uh, are likely to encounter social disadvantage via structural and or systemic queer phobia, um, that they're likely to adopt different strategies as a means of countering discriminatory practices that they face or to mitigate against their perceived or anticipated uh, barriers. Um, and that these experiences, while not universal, may be quite predominant. And so that might lead uh, agritourism operators and queer farmers in general that are part of the LGBTQ plus community to adopt different networks um, and to adopt different activities on their farm uh, for the success of their farm enterprises. That is, that in other words, their identities and their engagement in agritourism can be a place for new innovation and new entrepreneurial growth uh, to scale up their operations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Now I'll invite uh, Sue up to talk about uh, consumers of agritourism and marginalized groups. Thank you, Kinda. Um, so the reason I have been kind of brought to this panel is I have just finished up a book on uh, inclusion in tourism. Um, and one of the things that was quite surprising for me as I started this project was how little research is actually out there. And um, doing an edited book, I was very dependent on the authors with their particular area of interest in research and really was a struggle, like calling people that specialize in, in certain niche aspects, you know, people with disabilities or, um, and really struggling to fill a book with chapters. And so one of the things that did come out of it, we did get 14 chapters um, in the book. And one of the things that really came out of it is um, this really, the lack of role model and the lack of visibility of diversity in our field. Uh, I'm really more of a tourism person. I come from the tourism background with a passion for, for agriculture, but um, tourism is the modern day colonialism, right? It is people of color serving white guests or, um, you know, immigrants serving uh, rich, wealthy clientels. And so how we, as a research group, kind of begin to figure out the role of the consumer in this, uh, the chicken and the egg, which comes first? Does tourism become more diverse or do our customers become more diverse, therefore forcing us to, to embrace diversity? I was quite shocked, you know, I mean, especially after the last three or four years with the Black Lives Matter movement, I really thought that there was gonna be, you know, my doors would be flooded with all this amazing research and maybe the journals weren't ready to be publishing it yet. And this was gonna be this opportunity. And that is not the experience that I had. So one of the things that came out from the consumer perspective was really how do we make consumers feel welcome? Uh, I think one thing that tourism has really improved on is the marketing material that now presents a more diverse clientele. But at the same time, once that diverse clientele chooses to book to stay with us, whether it's an agro-tourism enterprise or whether it's even uh, urban tourism, urban food tourism, culinary tourism, uh, so much of the way that we do business is restrictive and discriminatory. Um, conversations that we have in our homogeneous groups uh, often don't translate well, and we don't know how to talk to people that have different cultures and different backgrounds than we do. And I think that's um, across the board, even if you are part of a marginalized group, sometimes we don't have appropriate vocabulary that translates, right? Much of what we say and the words we use are historical that we have learned um, over the generations. So one of the things that really came out of this is kind of sensitivity training. And I find that 
um, to be very generic. And I think one of the things that that I would like to, you know, you know, kind of get into the weeds on is what do we mean by sensitive sensitivity training and how do we actually help our employees choose appropriate words, vocabulary, bodily, uh, you know, gestures that are welcoming and warming to to very, very diverse groups um, and not trying to pigeonhole how we increase customer satisfaction with a particular group. But what can we do that translates to, you know, a variety of marginalized communities? So that's kind of what I'm hoping we can work with today from a consumer perspective is we are hospitality. We are supposed to be warm and welcoming, especially in agro-tourism where we are from the rurality, rurality that you know really sells home and comfort and warmth. And, and uh, I don't think that that is translating to a lot of our consumers out there. So that's kind of where I'm hoping um, a group that's interested in, in looking at consumers can investigate. Thank you, Sue. Um, my work has um, in this area has been primarily been um, working with um, uh, rural tribal communities um, in the desert Southwest and, and, and women. But I, when I think about some of the hurdles, if you will, or the issues um, that I see in working um, with, with any farmer or rancher, not just those from socially disadvantaged backgrounds is funding. Um, one of our speakers this morning mentioned about going to the bank <laughs> and being turned down three times. Um, and so um, recently in, in contributing um, to the book that Sue mentioned, um, I got together with some uh, people from USDA who are, are now either retired or working in, in um, academia, but who work for USDA before. And we put together some information on how the USDA has transformed um, their grant uh, programs um, and, there, and they have other programs um, to be more accommodating to socially disadvantaged audiences. Um, I, I guess in my honest opinion here is a lot of this um, is a result of um, all of the lawsuits <laughs> that, that they have been uh, subject to uh, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, there have been court cases involving Hispanic and women farmers, that's Garcia and Love, uh, Native American farmers and ranchers, that's Keep Siegel, uh, black farmers, that's Pigford and Pigford II, um, who basically went in to apply for a farm service agency loan or for a rural development grant and were uh, turned away. Um, and it's, it's not completely fixed by any means. Uh, I think the stat from 2021 is that um, close to 75% of white farmer loans were approved by the farm service agency, but only 37% of um, black farmer loan applications. Um, so uh, great strides. I mean, I started as an academic working with farmers uh, in rural parts of um, Nevada um, and Utah. Um, I'm still working in those two states. And there were like zero programs for beginning farmers and ranchers, zero programs that uh, emphasize um, small scale farming, um, especially agritourism, those types of things. Um, today, that is different. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through um, all the stats and things like that um, in this chapter, but I think it's important um, to, to, to point out that uh, in the last farm bill, um, which was approved in 2018, and, and um, uh, there's more discussion of, of what the farm bills and what it does. I mean, we are up to um, 500 million now um, in opportunities for small scale growers. Uh, through the Specialty Crops Grant Program and the LFMPP program and things like that. And many of those programs specifically target um, agritourism operations, food tourism operations, and um, especially those within the, the photo, which is called Opportunities Training and Outreach Program, which encompasses the 2501 Socially Disadvantaged Program, as well as the Beginning Farmer Rancher Program. They actually have specific um, targets in terms of applicants who are serving socially disadvantaged audiences. Um, as Jason pointed out, that terminology has specific meaning within these programs, and that has changed over time. Um, but I will say, um, whether the program mentions minority serving or mentions socially disadvantaged, it encompasses um, the great amount of thing of, of different groups that we've we've mentioned here today. Um, right now, there are six major programs through USDA that um, specifically target small farms and agritourism. 
Um, and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm looking at the funding. I mean, we're looking at, you know, a billion dollars <laughs> uh, in funding coming through. And much of that was actually um, even, even more enhanced in some of the, the COVID related funding changes that were made uh, in early 2021 and, and 2022. So um, I, you know, like I said, when I, when I started 20 years ago, the government funding situation um, in terms of, of USDA was, was nil for anyone who didn't fit um, um, the large crop commodity grower situation. And so, um, so I don't want to go into detail um, and I'm, I'm happy to also talk about um, uh, tribal agritourism, which I think is fascinating. Um, and so I'm the last uh, topic overview. Um, so before we break out into groups, I'd like to kind of, um, as several of our panel members um, discuss, get your feedback on what do you think are some of the big issues that maybe we haven't talked about, because I'd like to take our time in our groups, and I know we have only an hour today and we're starting to get towards the end. I'd like to break out into, into four groups here um, in, in, in person and in, in one group with the online. But, um, and I was hoping to be able to fill in some stuff here, but that's, they're in control of the, of the PowerPoint over there. But um, what are some, some major issues and obstacles that, that you're finding in, in serving, um, serving groups? Um, yes, which could you come up and speak at the, actually, would you mind handing her the, the thank you. I'll say as a farmer, I find land access probably being one of right. the biggest thing and that also stops from a lot of funding because you don't own it, your lease and the terms of the lease, that's a whole nother thing, depending on if you're on a nonprofit parcel or however that works. So that I will say has been the biggest um, challenge is the land access. Um, and then when it comes to funding to help you get that capital to become profitable, mm -hmm. um, it's just a whole nother thing. And it's like, I kind of just noticed like there wasn't a lot of farmers in here and it's more like extensions. And so I find working with, as a farmer, working with nonprofits and extensions, it's like, it's challenging because they don't know a lot of what our challenges are. I don't think right. I've ever really been asked what is one of my biggest challenges um, as a farmer and to become profitable and, you know, possibly have like an Airbnb or a farm store, be able to do like these farm to table dinners and, oh, it all sounds amazing. Um, but when you look at it, you're like, I don't even have the funding. I might not even make it through the year. And with the climate change, let's just be honest, you know, where I'm at right now, it's droughts in water bands and the season is so short. By the time you start, it's already time to wrap it up. So I feel like those are a lot of the obstacles. And then it's more so you have to tap back out and do the research and perfect this. And by that time, so much time has already passed and you're just like, where are the resources and where is the funding to help me to, I just want to grow food. That's, <laughs> that's all I want to do. And it's like, it's so complicated, but it's also so political and that's a whole nother thing. But mm -hmm. I guess that's been my biggest thing is the land access and like it's so much of it being unused and so much that's preserved for agriculture it's like so then why can't I grow on it and then again it's just the land access perfect thank you it looks like you are also trying to incorporate in technical yes. technical assistance with that okay all right thanks Hi, I um, think that an issue that should be addressed is on definition. Perhaps it's not relevant much to the US, I don't know. But I think we um, there is no universal uh, definition of agritourism. And uh, traditionally, it is left to the country specific um, scenario to define. And I think it's important uh, to really um, raise some of the issues the, the relevance of how we define agritourism. And I'll say, for example, in South Africa, which has a very unique history, where there is a vast inequ inequality between white farmers and uh, black farmers. And the ones that are jumping ahead of promoting agritourism in South Africa 
are the white farmers. And the, they are purists when it comes to, I mean, in general, when it comes to definition of agritourism, those that believe that agritourism is basically any activity, it must be on the farm. I think that's very short-sighted and mm -hmm. runs the risk of, particularly, for example, in the case of South Africa, leaving aside a large uh, population that is historically marginalized. And so you have opportunities where, for example, we, we learned this morning, um, someone presented and said, uh, based on a survey, none of the respondents really um, had any major needs. As you, when you dig further, you'd realize that these respondents were all white South African farmers. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you just maintain that purist definition of agritourism, then um, the majority, if not all of the black South African farmers and colleagues and all the rest of other ethnic groups that have been uh, marginalized will not be able to benefit from the policies that would be promoted based on the definition. And you have uh, along the value chain, a lot of dynamic opportunities to have these backward linkages to farmers that don't have the resources to have people, tourists on their farm or don't have that interest, but they can not participate at other nodes of the value chain. So I was just curious if you guys can elaborate how you deal with definition on um, this. Um, I think real quickly, um, Sue, do you wanna talk about that? Yeah, I was gonna, I, I was thinking as you were saying that, that that's not uncommon in this country either. We have a lot of um, community-based farming and some of it's urban. Uh, you look at a lot of urban farms that are owned or at least managed by uh, communities that are usually um, of some kind of ethnic descent. And so they and they have a different cultural model where family and community and neighbors are, um, you know, work together and they don't technically fall into your your definition either. So I do think that that is a universal issue. Um, I can honestly say from the academic perspective, when you start getting into the definition of words, you get a bunch of academics in the room, you'll never get out of there, right? That, that's something that can go on for years. But when it comes to policy, it is important, I think, that we, those of us that are passionate about it, come up with a kind of united front that we find ways to communicate our needs, our challenges in a way that becomes universally understood, which then by even doing that kind of comes back to the majority, right? Then we, we, we kind of try to put together something that, that you can communicate to the majority in their language. So I think what you're saying is, is very, very vital and very important. And again, as I said, there's just not a lot of research in this area, especially when you start dealing with agro-tourism in particular. And these are a lot of the issues that, that we hopefully will start trying to solve, but there hasn't been the research to do it yet. If I can, just can you come up here? Because I can hear you on the on the online. One very quick piggyback, so I actually can tie these two comments together. This definitional issue, at least in the United States, also plays into the land access issue that you're bringing up. Um, in the US, we have a thing called heirs property, particularly in the South, which is um, basically related to how you um, receive property the front as, as a former um, uh, slave, right? And, and how property was handed down and how you consolidate property. But the other thing is how we define things in our federal programs in the United States can preclude certain strategies that you might use to say solve land access, like forming a cooperative or a collective from then being able to access federal funding programs, right? So you may adopt one kind of strategy to solve a problem, but then create a new problem on the other side because now you're out of definition. I would like to add uh, one thing that for me is there are so many health problems that can be solved with agritourism. I believe we all concur on that. And people who have health problems as well are mainly not included. And I, I speak on personal experience. I, I work with farmers all across Puerto Rico with them. I help them work with agritourism. Um, which farm is the best to receive uh, people who cannot walk, people who cannot, who, people who are blind, maybe a tour for the blind. Um, maybe the bird watching is something that they will really enjoy. How do you start tailoring to different communities and their disabilities? I am part of a disability community. I have multiple sclerosis and I'm thinking which farm I'm gonna take them, which is gonna be best for them. All this 
questions and how do we make them something like um, a system we can all share with everybody? I don't know, we have that information as well. Thank you, that's we a good don't. point. So the, uh, the access um, to health issues and, and that type of thing within the forum, thank you. Um, so we are um, coming up on the end of our time, unfortunately. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna let you guys make more comments, but I'm gonna make a little change in plan here. I am gonna put some sheets up here with a topic up top. If you would like to be on a working group in the future to discuss this virtually through email, please come up and just write your name and email address and I will organize these groups later. So before you leave today, if, if you're interested in working on one of these topics, um, because um, we're, we're, we're unfortunately almost out of town, out of time, but we do have time for more comments and suggestions and feedback from the panel. Do we have something online? Sure. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Great. Yeah, thanks. I just made a comment that um, in, I live in a very rural area um, that skews conservative politically, and I, the U.S. political climate of division is a major issue right now. Um, many of the farms that are practicing agritourism have also uh, very outwardly proclaimed their conservative stance. They have signs posted and the language that they use in speaking, um, and this given the, the current issues and conservative stances on um, things like critical race theory, abortion, gay rights, uh, you name the issue uh, as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, this creates a very unwelcoming environment uh, for potential customers. So I just wanted to lift that up and I'm not really sure uh, how to necessarily approach that as, as a systemic issue, but I would be very curious to chat with others who are in similar areas. Uh, yeah, we have a uh, we have comment in the back. Uh, yes, um, to tie everything together, I believe there's a couple of steps. One step would be a real concern that um, would start off with some of the uh, programming, like the federal programming that you mentioned about the um, like the research. There's a way to. I mean, like how much strength do we have to actually curve or direct some of the, um, I guess some of the decisions from the top down basically, because some of the um, ways I've seen in the past, there was, there's like a, a, a level of like, like steps or levels that could work its way down to the actual farmers. Mm -hmm. Like I noticed there was a, um, there was a way you could put a group in charge or a person in charge of the funding and then they would take the funding to the next level like it would be like a tier type of um mm -hmm. setup where there wouldn't be an overall umbrella it would be sectioned off in certain areas that would be like one way to be closer to the need instead of having a um like being so out of reach so to speak. So just like a concern, and then you can have that sincere, um, that sincere uh, application of what you desire or your need or what you wanted to accomplish would be, um, you know, be closer to the person that is in need of it. So that's yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I can talk to this this funding situation. That model that you're you're outlining is actually um, being used in in some ways. Um, I can only speak to the USDA programs where they have members of the communities that they are trying to serve um, on their advisory boards for how their programs are set up. And this is recent, though. I mean, this is just recently. Um, and they also, um, especially for those of us who are working um, in research and academia, looking for input on looking at how these programs have actually played out and actually impacted um, the audiences. 
um, that they were targeting. So those are two things that they've changed and are, and are looking to change and, and make differently. Um, but that's just the USDA funding that, that I'm familiar with. Um, they actually do have a grant program that they give down to the states and let the states make the decision. And I realize that's still at a pretty macro, pretty high, high level, but it is taking it out of the hands of, of the federal government control, at least um, in that particular, that particular program. That's especially a crop block grant that I'm sure many of you are, are aware of, but thank you. Thank you. I want to speak a little bit about the issue about definition of agrotourism. When we promote law in my country, we, yes, we use, there is no too much difference in Russian between agrotourism and rural tourism. And when we develop, uh, we uh, mean rural tourism because we never split the production part in te technology, because here I can see more about technology, how to produce cider or uh, maple syrup, uh, whatever. But in our country, there is a different kind of <clears throat> population. We live in the villages because we came through socialism, communism, but everybody was forced to live together. For example, we have been traveling now through three states, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And you have a lot of land, your houses are very separated. In our country, no, village. And rural um, dwellers created a wonderful culture. There is a huge intangible heritage. And lady from Uganda told about it, dancing, uh, cooking, uh, a relationship between uh, family members. It's a it's very interesting things for tourists. So I would somehow, if I were here, to combine all of that. It's not an issue of if you have land or not. You could be wonderful craftsman. You could be a wonderful singer. For example, your heritage, this country music or Bourbon production or many, many other things which should be part of a tour if I go to rural areas. This is just what we're trying to do in Belarus. Thank you. Thanks, Lyra. Um, and Hello, ma'am. Um, the Native American communities that I'm aware Hello, of. Hello, ma'am. Comment or question online? Yes. Uh, hello. Um, I have a certain question with regards to innovative research and outreach in entrepreneurship. The question is that how can technology be leveraged to encourage children or urban population towards farming? Because I'll give you a context. In India, especially city dwellers like children have too many distractions and the farms are far away from the cities and it takes a lot of time, which makes uh, visits possible only during weekends. And then what happens is this impacts how they view nature as exposure is very limited. Furthermore, they are not attracted towards agriculture as a career, viable career option. So given this scenario, can something be done to catch them young, catch them conveniently and catch them without adding to the distractions? Something like from farm to farm will. Distance and those types of things. Is that what I understood? I understand that correctly. Yeah, access. Okay, Sue, did you want to talk about that? No, I just, I just wanted to have a comment. I think um, I think you know, we're kind of in a world where we are a first generation developing uh, the you know the what's the the the. Oh. I'll tell you, middle age, you lose your vocabulary, it disappears. Um, but the role model, right? You know, we start looking at um, at the role models of my life were white men, and not that there's anything wrong with white men, but I didn't see myself in them, right? And I was thinking, I remember, you know, I've been an academic all that long because I started late, and I remember people saying, "But there aren't any women and people of color in academia." Well, of course there were. But a lot of them got PhDs and couldn't get jobs in academia. So there were a lot of very qualified people. They were not working in the field. 
And I think we have a lot of that in this country. I think we have a lot of, of uh, incredibly talented people and the goal is really to find them and highlight them and create a world where agro-tourism is presented as a diverse industry, as a diverse opportunity. Um, and I think it's organizations like this that have that opportunity and what we choose to do with these networks that we're making after we leave here. I'm, I'm you know, very impressed that Kinda has offered to kind of put together a working group, but it is our responsibility, those of us here that have the passion for it, to start showcasing that there is diversity out there in agro-tourism and it's not what the rest of the world thinks it is because they don't have a definition for it you know it's it's rural communities which as um someone online said you know is is a very conservative uh political uh stereotype and i live in one of those communities i live in oregon you think it's ultra liberal but i live in a community that is very very conservative um and so I think it is our responsibility to, to continue this. We have these conferences, we get all passionate work up, and then we kind of go about our daily lives. So I think, I think the, the role is here, what can we do? We didn't get to break out into our sessions, but what can we do together um, over the next two days and how do we solidify that into, into a movement? Um, we have farmers, we have academics, we have cooperative extension, we've got the right people. We just got to connect the dots to create the network. Thanks, Sue. Um, and it, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I want to thank uh, our panel members today. If everyone can give them a hand. Um, I have placed uh, uh, five sheets with five different topics um, with a name at the top. If you are interested in being on a working group to address this uh, research outreach or, or, or just being a community member and, and your perspective, please come up and just write your name and in your email address as legibly as possible. Uh, I'm gonna, hoping I can um, enroll my, my other uh, panel members here to maybe take responsibility uh, initially for, for one of the groups to just kind of start an online forum discussion. For those of you who have joined us online, um, feel free to email me and I will, the, the, the group inclusion that you're interested in, and, and I will get you on that uh, email list serve. So um, again, this is not all of them, it's five of them. Um, and um, the titles are just me guessing. So um, please don't be offended by the title I chose if you feel it's somewhat similar to the thing that you have imagined. Uh, just put your name down there. So uh, again, everything will be online. And then um, we have someone here that's actually in charge of the session. So I'm going to let her come up and do the any closing details that, that I missed uh, to, to close it out. Thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate uh, you coming and your input today.